Hello, and welcome to online worship with First Christian Church of Valparaiso, Indiana. During Lent, we are taking a closer look at stories of Jesus' healing of those who were broken in some way. People gathered around Jesus as his reputation became known from town to town. As we gather virtually today, we too are yearning for presence, for peace, for help. We also are broken in some way. Images of broken and transformed beach glass remind us of Christ's movement toward wholeness and healing within us and among us. gathers us as beachcombers gathers and marvel at every precious surviving piece of beach glass she finds. We are never alone and we are never lost to the one who seeks humanity's wholeness. We affirm our commitment to be the body of Christ and know we cannot be personally healed until we see the interconnected community as part of the process of healing. Jesus has the power to revision the family of God in which false boundaries are overcome. In a year of devastating loss, let us lift in prayer, song and thought, the social and economic factors that affect our personal health and the health of our community.
Please join me in a responsive reading form of prayer. God of all, you created us to live in community. You place within us a need for companionship that binds us together. Yet too often we have broken down our relationships and instead of building them up. And so where ignorance, self-love, and insensitivity have fractured life and community. Give us, us your, your light, light, O God, God of love. love. Where we have set ourselves against one another, where injustice and oppression have broken people's spirits. Give, give us, us your light, O God, God of peace. Where hunger and poverty, illness, death, and hardship make life an unbearable burden for many. Give, Give us your life, O oh God, God of grace. And where suspicion and hatred, conflict and fear have challenged your goodness. Give, Give us your light, O oh God, God of peace. Eternal God, God open, open the, the eyes of the nations and, and the peoples, peoples so that all may walk in the light of love. love. Remove our ignorance and stubbornness, so that all may drink from the fountain of your goodness. Amen. Let us now take a moment of silence to acknowledge our desire for wholeness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come in your presence to glorify and proclaim your name as our Savior and Healer. Help us to be ever mindful of your love for us. Help us to reflect your love for us as we love one another. Strengthen us, repair us, heal us as we struggle with our challenges of living. We especially ask your blessing on those who are suffering from difficulties, ripping at their lives, shredding hope and happiness. Grant them peace. Help us all to be a positive influence in healing broken families, communities, nations, and our world. We ask for guidance and strength as we heard, hear, heed the words of this prayer that you gave to us, saying, Our Father, who art, who art, in, heaven. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Know this, the love and security of Christ offers is meant for all people, no matter what. We can share our light and not run out of it. Enough Christ hospitality broke through false boundaries and points the way. Take a deep breath. Let in the truth. Now breathe out with the relief of assurance. Imagine that the light of Christ surrounds you, but also extends to those near you, those beyond your walls in the wider community. 
know that it spreads like the rising sun extending to all the world. During Lent this year, we are focusing on stories of Jesus healing the broken ones of Israel and beyond. In today's story, Jesus breaks down boundaries by including Gentiles in God's mercy and grace. This is Matthew 8, verses 5 through 13. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, appealing to him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed in terrible distress. Jesus said to him, I will come and cure him. The centurion answered, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. If I say to one, Go, he goes, and to another, Come, he comes, and to my slave, Do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard him, he was amazed and said to those who follow him, Truly, I tell you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and will eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the heirs of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, while they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you according to your faith. And the servant was healed at that very moment. May God bless to our hearing and understanding this reading from the Holy Word. Amen. Amen. Welcome, friends. Good to have you worshiping with us. 
The centurion who approached Jesus was part of an elite officer corps that formed the backbone of the Roman army. A Roman legion consisted of 6,000 troops. They were divided into 60 units called centuries, and each of those contained 100 men commanded by a centurion. The centurions were key middle managers, if you will, who were responsible for army discipline, and they were crucial to the Roman military machine. Now, when you hear the word centurion, the first image that may come to mind uh, might be from movies like Gladiator or Spartacus or Ben-Hur. In my mind, a centurion is comparable to a company commander. But one thing I know for sure is that he was a heavily muscled, experienced fighter who could have kicked my little behind in three seconds or less. I'm also extremely confident that the Jewish people of Jesus' day despised centurions. Not only were they important cogs in the machine that conquered Israel, but we know that while maintaining that occupation, they often abused their power. That's why John the Baptist told some Roman soldiers who, for whatever reason, sought his ethical advice, he told them, soldiers, don't force people to pay money to make you leave them alone. Be satisfied with your pay. Hmm. But while most people in Israel would have hated him no matter what, we get some huge clues that the particular centurion in our story may have been a different kind of man. For starters, he apparently has a servant who is dear to his heart. Compassion for a servant was unheard of in New Testament times. The Greek philosopher Aristotle said there could be no friendship and no, no justice toward inanimate things, nor toward a horse, an ox, or a slave. Because master and slave have nothing in common. A slave, he said, is a living tool, just as a tool is an inanimate slave. The Roman writer Varro maintained that the only difference between a slave and a cart is that the slave talks. So the fact that the centurion that we're looking at cared so much for his servant meant he was at least trying to swim against the evil tide of the institution of slavery. He was also willing to risk the ridicule of the men under and over him, men who would surely criticize him for going to a Jewish citizen of the country they were subjugating, and get this, politely, even respectfully, asking this Jew for help? Oh, they'd have laughed at him for that. He went anyway. And the most obvious thing that makes the centurion impressive is the sheer depth of his faith. Jesus is amazed. The centurion has faith in his power to heal just with a word. Plus, simply by approaching Jesus, he signals his faith that Jesus is willing to cross cultural barriers, ignore prejudice, risk, all to alleviate a stranger's suffering. The centurion believes it before he even sees it. In the Gospels, Jesus does not look positively on people who say seeing is believing who are always asking for signs that he is who he claims to be. Such people are stubbornly blind to what Jesus is doing and, what, and they want one more miracle, a miracle on their terms, thank you very much. In fact, this is the only story in the Gospels where Jesus is described as being amazed in a positive way about someone's faith. In a few verses after today's reading, the disciples freak out because a storm is about to swamp their boat. Jesus tells them, why are you so frightened? What little faith you have. And then he orders the winds and waves to chill out. Truthfully, I'm actually kind of sympathetic to the disciples in that case. I love Jesus, I believe in him, but if I'm ever in a boat about to be swamped by hurricane winds, 
I'm pretty sure I'm going to be screaming like a little girl. However, this is before that incident. This time with the centurion happens before that. So imagine this. If you were Peter, James, or John, what would your emotional response be to a soldier of the army occupying your country, coming to Jesus and asking for a miraculous healing? Am I the only, am I the only one who thinks just maybe the response would be, boy, this guy's got a lot of nerve. I might even have wondered if it was a trap. And to me, those kind of responses would be very understandable. But they're not at all how Jesus responds. He demonstrates a love for others that is, frankly, greater than ours. I suspect he's also intrigued to be approached by someone in whom he doesn't even expect to find any faith, much less an impressive one. Now, I don't want to overmake this case. The centurion is apparently a good guy. In fact, when Luke tells this story, some Jewish elders uh, inform Jesus, quote, he deserves your help. He loves our people, and he even built a synagogue for us. So he's all right. But God does not answer our prayers because we're all right, because of how good we are. If you ever find yourself praying, God, I deserve to be given this request. Well, I don't know if you'll get it, but I do know that you're wrong. You don't deserve it. None of us do. We don't deserve anything. God gives out of generosity and goodness, grace, love. And by the way, God's love is a lot broader than most people want it to be. The first Bible verse many of us remember learning by heart. John 3, 16. God so loved the church and people who look exactly like me and was so impressed by our goodness that God... No. That's not how it goes at all, is it? It's God so loved the world. Jesus may be impressed by the centurion, but he helps him out of love. And one sign of the depth of his love is that he so, as soon as he hears of the need, he says, I will come to your home and cure him. I will come. Let me pick that apart for a second. According to rabbinical law, if Jesus were to enter a Gentile home, he would be unclean. But he's willing to risk it in order to share God's love and grace with a man his fellow Jews believe at, le at best to be far less favored by God, and at worst, a man they see as a murderous sinner to be avoided at all costs. Any Pharisee listening is sure to be disgusted, of course, but look at the scene in your mind's eye, and I expect you'll notice even the disciples' jaws are dropping. This is still early in Jesus' ministry. It'll be years before the disciples have much of a clue about who Jesus is and what he's about. And the last thing any of them get is how big God draws the circle. In fact, if anybody's excluded from the circle, it should be people who know better. They want to make the circle smaller if they can. Jesus says, quote, I tell you, many will come from east and west and will eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the heirs of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. Ouch. So, if we want to follow Jesus' example, what are the implications for our attitude and approach to other people? especially those who may appear on the surface to be quite different from us. His words are unexpected. The words we just heard, they're, they're even scary, but they're also exciting. Unexpected and scary because 
The idea of Gentiles, or non-Jews, people not like us, sitting at the table in the kingdom of heaven with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is just mind-blowing. I'm sure you've heard the old joke of newcomers to heaven being told to tiptoe past a room full of Catholics or Protestants or Evangelicals or Muslims or Jews or fill in whatever group you want. But why are they sneaking past? Because, say it with me, they think they're the only ones here. Hmm. It'd be funnier if it wasn't something we had to admit is pretty universally true. However, one has to ask, do we even have friends all that different from us? Do any of us have a friend of a different race or a nationality? A friend whose socioeconomic class is significantly different than our own? A friend who dresses way differently, cuts their hair way differently, votes way differently, even inks and pierces their body? way differently. How good are we at looking at individuals different than us and not seeing what we feel they need to fix or change or cover up? How good are we at instead seeing someone God loves, someone for whom Christ died? Hmm. Our Lord's unexpected Words are a scary spiritual challenge that all of us need to wrestle with. On the other hand, Jesus' words are exciting because they open the door of faith, open the family of God to all people, including Gentiles like the Roman centurion and like us. To truly and humbly rejoice in that, act on it, that is a challenge. One that by its difficulty implies our most frequent prayer probably should be like the man in Mark 9, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Well, it's hard. It's hard to embrace others. And maybe it shouldn't surprise us that it's hard because it's always been hard. In Jesus' first sermon, Luke chapter 4, he reminds the congregation of God's mercy toward outsiders in the past. Outsiders like the widow of Zarephath that Elijah went to. And then there was Elisha, who healed the Syrian general Naaman. And let me remind you that uh, the congregation did not say, Amen, preach it, brother, to that sermon. Oh, they hated Jesus for that sermon. To believe that God's love is going to people I don't want it going to? That's a tough sell. The church may be the only organization whose founding document, Scripture, is beloved, but also constantly reminding us that we exist not just for those on the inside, but also for those on the outside. Now, this sermon has been an insider talking to other insiders, but thanks to the centurion, it's time for those of us inside. And by the way, if you're watching this on Sunday morning, you are a really faithful insider because you're worshiping on the warmest, nicest day in February. Thank you so much. But it's time for us insiders to receive a revelation from, of all people, a centurion, an outsider. And who knows? Maybe not the only one. There may be somebody in this strange electronic congregation that we find ourselves a part of who is not an insider, who is well and truly outside, empathizing with the centurion, somebody who feels out of place, but also somebody who finds Jesus compelling. If you are such a person, welcome. How we need you. 
We need your questions, your different perspective. We need your faith, your faith that all Jesus has to do is speak and your life will be healed. Your very presence with us is proof that Jesus is still busy reclaiming the world. He is ushering in God's kingdom by creating a kingdom in which all people gather to respect our diversity, enjoy one another, and feast at the table of God. Amen. Well, with that, friends, it's time to prepare for communion by singing together one bread, one body. At this point, we normally collect an offering, so please continue to offer your prayers for the church, the family of God, and for all of the world. And if you continue to make a traditional offering, you can mail them to the church or click on the Donate tab of this screen. If you want, you can pause this, the, screen, the service right now so that you can get your elements for communion. Faithful God, your promise in Jesus was that we would neither be forgotten nor forsaken. In these days of isolation, it is indeed reassuring to know that you are here and that you do indeed care for us. In the sign of this bread broken and shared, we know that you understand our circumstances and that your companionship is something we can count on in the days ahead. By your Holy Spirit, the promised comforter, be present in this moment of communion with your gifts of solace and strength. The cup is something we share in this moment, is the sign of your great love for us, poured out abundantly in Jesus Christ. 
on the cross where he was crucified, he created community by placing his mother in John's care. Help us who share this moment of communion together continue that community by caring for each other. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, whose body was broken her, and blood was shed for our forgiveness of sins. Amen. Uh, one of the elders just recently commented that it would be nice if we could all share in the communion at the same time as we watch the video. This may not be possible, but when we think of communion, as uh, Mary just said, it is a sharing. And that's what, that's what communion means, is sharing. And it started with Christ on the night he had a supper in an upper room with his disciples. And he took bread, he blessed it, broke it, and said, see, this is my body broken for you. And then in the same manner, at the end of the meal, he took a cup of wine and he said, and see this wine as the blood of a new covenant that I have made with God for you on your behalf and do this in remembrance of me. So in like manner, we share the bread and the loaf and the wine and the cup as Christ's disciples did some several thousand years ago. The words of Jesus we heard in this week's healing story were, I will come. When faced with a request, Jesus makes a move to help one who has previously seemed to be outside of help's embrace. He moves outward to gather in and heal someone unlikely to have crossed his path otherwise, because all within God's circle of safekeeping. Think about people you know or have heard about recently who are broken in some way in need of healing. These may be people you don't usually spend time thinking about. To what part of our community shall we, the body of Christ, say, we will come? Where do you personally need to be healed? Consider letting someone know what you need, including Jesus. Jesus invites us always to ask. This is one message of the healing stories. Stories that remind all is a big word. It may include some we'd rather it didn't. Happily, it also includes us.
would you receive a benediction? Let us now go from this service with confidence that the holy beach comer is gathering each of us for safekeeping, recovering our depth of love for all and our joy in living. May the words of Jesus ring in our ears, I will come. And may the Spirit hover, move, deliver salve to our souls, and perhaps even put a spring in our step. Amen. Well, friends, let me thank you one last time for worshiping with us. But now I have a few housekeeping announcements about our church life. One, the elders have decided that as long as our area stays out of the red COVID-wise, we can safely resume in-person worship at 9.30 a.m. starting this next Sunday, March 7th. We will, however, still wear masks and practice social distancing and we will continue to offer this YouTube service for those who wish to continue worshiping that way. Two, let me one last time offer our hope that you've been able to fill out and return the survey form our pastoral search team mailed out. If not, now's the time. And if you didn't get one, please call the church office. Three, we also hope that you'll pick up one of these free booklets which have a devotion for each day in Lent of 2021. They're in the black mailbox next to the Education Wing's B door, or you can call the church office and we'll mail you one. And finally, our youth are meeting tonight, some in person, some virtually, for games and Bible study from 5.30 to 7 p.m. They'll need a smartphone for the games, and if they're participating from home, they'll also need a computer to get on Zoom. Call me or Kelly Ellis or Mike DeGan to get the link. And well, with that, friends, keep on smiling, be healthy, and blessings on you.